Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. And I just would like to say that I'm the 0.1% of physicians in the United States. I'll start with that. Just because what we practice is really not standard of care yet. And hopefully, it will become standard of care. Um, so first of all, I want everyone actually to stand up just for a moment. And this seems like a futile exercise, but the reason I'm saying this is because one out of three of you in this room have a gene in which when you sit for more than a couple hours, you start to, you start to make more of an inflammatory cytokine called IL-8. In this room, I just want to raise your hands. Who is uncomfortable sitting for more than two hours? Is it about one third? Look around, people. Keep your hands up for a second. Keep your hands up for a second. It's about one third of us. That's genetic. So those people that just raised their hands, I can confirm that with genomics. And I can also mention that you might want to get a standing desk if you don't already have one, because it would actually reduce your inflammation. So I'll have everyone sit down. Thank you very much for that quick exercise. <laughs> oh, let me see if I can find this. So, so what do I do? Um, so I, I got trained traditionally. Um, I was an academic professor for Mercer University in Savannah, Georgia. I loved it there. I worked for 10 years in a hospital setting as an academic hospitalist, and I used to have rounds of you know, residents and pharmacy students, and we would do all the academic stuff, and it was fantastic. And we provided excellent care. We would get people out of hospital in 48 hours. And I'm sure all of you know this. How many, how many here are, are actually providers? Can I have a raise of hands? A few of us, okay. And, and how many of you here are in the payer services? All of you, maybe. <laughs> so the reason I'm asking this question is because as a provider, you know, you're taught in medical school how to provide the best care for most people most of the time. And that makes sense. But what about the people that don't get improved? What about the 25% of people that don't get better and that burden our system with chronic disease? That's where I'm going to talk about. Um, and so when I got trained in traditional medicine, I then realized that we couldn't help some people. There was a big burden. And the Cleveland Clinic had just started something called the Functional Medicine Program. And I got trained and vetted through the Cleveland Clinic in functional medicine. And I realized that there were other avenues that we could take, although initially more expensive, would save hundreds of thousands of dollars in the long run with just a few patients. Because we would actually find the actual root cause. I'm sure you guys have heard of root cause medicine. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so there are actually published studies on this. This is a study from the Cleveland Clinic that took 7,000 patients that were treated in the functional medicine model. And all of them had high, much higher performances versus the controls in quality of life metrics. They all felt better. They all did better. They had less fatigue. They slept better. They had less gastrointestinal problems, less inflammatory problems. So this model works. This is an example of one disease called rheumatoid arthritis. I'm sure everyone knows who that is. Very, very common inflammatory arthritis. The 318 patients were treated with a functional medicine model, which is in addition to the traditional model. And of course, they had significantly improved outcomes, less pain, less inflammation, less relapses, less occurrences, less admissions to the hospital, less hospital visits, less clinic visits. So this makes sense. Um, so when people say, what do you do as a functional doctor? What makes you different? Well, I said, first of all, I order a lot more testing. Because the average doctor will order a CBC and a CMP, some basic lab work. And I have this array of testing I can use. And for the simple fact that I'm only going to be here for, for not the longest period of time, I'm going to talk about those three bolded areas. Genomics, which is an emerging field of medicine. Heavy metal testing, which is not taught in medical school, and pesticide testing, which is not taught in medical school. Has anyone in this room ever been tested for heavy metals? One person. OK. Has anyone in this room ever been tested for pesticides? One person. Now, who do you think in this room, of, of all these people, how many people would you guys guess have heavy metal toxicity right now in this room. If I just took a random sample of everyone's blood. It's going to be hard to tell, but I would tell you it's about one in five. That's a lot. We're talking about mercury. We're talking about arsenic. Oh, we don't have arsenic in the United States. Yes, we do. But 
we're going to get into that conversation in a second. Let's talk about genomics. Genomics, as you know, is a study of your DNA. So simple, we just take a swab of your saliva, we send it off. Multiple companies now can do a, a array V-chip analysis, 250,000 mutations. So just so you understand, we all have 20,000 genes, and 99% of them are identical to a chimpanzee. But we're not chimpanzees, right? We're a little bit like chimpanzees, but pretty, pretty different. So that's because we have the 250,000 mutations or epigenetics, above genetics, that are differentiating our expression into a human being versus a chimpanzee. So this is really what sets us apart. So we get one copy from your mom and one copy from your dad. So if you get the perfect copy from your mom and the perfect copy from your dad, you don't have disease. If you get one disease copy from your mom and one disease copy from your dad, you're gonna be sick. But if you only have one disease copy, that's where genomics comes in. We go, well, you're not, you're not gonna be that sick, but you're gonna have problems. And we can actually, and if you have enough of these, because there's 250,000, so if you have five or six or seven of the right haplotype SNPs, it's a haplotype is a combination of genes that increases your, your prevalence for disease, then you might have a five-fold increased risk for Alzheimer's dementia. Would you wanna know that? Would you wanna know you have a four-fold risk for stroke or 10-fold risk for diabetes? And we can predict these things at the time of your birth. So you can literally modify your entire environmental, you know, everything. You can, you can affect your, how you eat, how you exercise, what supplements you should take. It's so amazing what we have at our discretion. And now, you know, genomics, when the Human Genome Project occurred, we didn't know what we were doing. Okay, the, the person who helped develop the tool that I work with is a Harvard, Harvard physician who has a team of PhDs who has 10,000 studies. Most of them are evidence-based tier one or tier two. This is strong evidence. So I think we have enough evidence now to suggest that we can really start using genomics as a clinical application tool. Um, so again, if you have an odds ratio for disease, it helps. So for example, if I see a patient and they have an odds ratio of dementia twofold, that's pretty significant, right? Everyone has one fold or one odds ratio for disease. If someone has five odds ratio, I'm concerned, and I'm gonna act very proactively. I'm gonna get an MRI when they're 50. I'm gonna put them on, a, on an intermittent fasting diet. I'm gonna make sure the A1C is very low, but below 5.2, keep their sugar down. So there's all these things you can really do nowadays that we're not, we're not aware of. The reason I'm bringing this up is because of this. We have the second highest GDP in the world. We do pretty well, okay? But we spend one fifth of that in healthcare. Now, I'm actually pretty impressed with that. I think it's great that we spend money in healthcare. I want to spend money in my healthcare. But this is the problem. 90% of that spending is on chronic health conditions and mental health conditions. So we're losing the battle, and, we're, and we could be a little bit more efficient. This is another point that I like to mention. Compared to all other industrialized countries, we're spending two times as much on healthcare which is still impressive. Listen, I'm, I'm proud of that. We, have, we, can, we can do that. We have the money to do that. That's great. The problem is we're off the graph. This is a graph showing how much we make per person, an average of the United States, $63,000, yet we're spending $12,000 a year on healthcare. That ratio is a little bit, a little bit steep for some people. The other problem is compared to every other developed country, London, Switzerland, Germany, we are living four years younger across the board. So we're spending twice as much, but we're not living as long. So that made me scratch my head and go, what are we doing wrong? Is it the air we breathe? No, well, we're in a pretty clean area. Is it chemicals? Is it food? Maybe it's the food. So I started thinking, what about the pesticides? Are the pesticides a problem? And, and functional medicine has detailed this in, in great detail, so much data behind this. Because we use more pesticides, you see all those diseases? Parkinson's, infertility, birth defects, allergies, otitis media, ear infections, preeclampsia, hypertension with pregnancy, metabolic syndrome, which is an underlying problem that develops into diabetes at 300 billion a year. Obesity, 260 billion a year, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And because we're over farming, and by the way, so GMO, when GMO crops were created, they were created with great intentions and they did a great job we feed the whole world, essentially, year-round. We have crops that can literally grow in any condition. And the problem with that is when you grow a crop year-round and you don't give the soil a rest, 
you deplete minerals. So we have that problem. So this is just showing you that compared to other industrialized countries, we use 322 million pounds of banned pesticides per year. Yeah, United, Europe is not using these pesticides, but we are. And I think this is a problem. And so obesity is a $260 billion issue. Well, did you guys know? I don't know if you knew this, but they did a, they did a little research. If you ate organic, which means less pesticides, you had much less obesity, metabolic syndrome, preeclampsia, lymphoma, birth defects, allergies. Uh, I mean, it, it, it just, it's, it's ridiculous. Infertility. So there's no question now that we have enough data showing, this is another study from Thailand, that if you were an agricultural worker, you had a lot more disease and a lot more obesity. Obesity is the underpinning problem in America. So you keep looking at all these things and you go, okay, pesticides equal obesity, weight gain, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Why does every man that I see in my clinic, not every man, but I say one out of three, have low testosterone? Why do all these young women have irregular periods, low progesterone, infertility? Because we have a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are pesticides. So now that I've gone on this negative tangent and everyone's depressed, we're gonna, we're gonna pivot a little bit. But right before I pivot, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper in depression, okay? Glyphosate, it's the world's most widely produced herbicide. 700 different products in agriculture. It's used everywhere. You guys have used Roundup, I'm sure, once in your life. Roundup has glyphosate. Glyphosate's being sued every way possible because of these things. And lymphoma is the biggest thing. But now we're having pancreatic cancer, skin tumors. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's got, and, and not to mention autism, which is a huge problem, metabolic disorder. And you know, autism has been, the prevalence of autism has been skyrocketing. And people don't know who to blame. Is it, is it this? Is it that? Is it childhood diseases? Is it vaccines? It's pesticides. We have so many problems that we can target, but we have to be aware of the problems to begin with. So how do you check for glyphosate? When I was in medical school, I never learned about glyphosate. Lawyers taught me about glyphosate. I didn't know about glyphosate. So then I said, well, functional medicine knows about, well, that's interesting. So you know, do you guys know that in medicine, there's not, a, there's not a field of environmental specialty. So you can't go, I want to be a doctor and be environmental specialist, or I want to be a toxicologist in environmental, you can't do that. There's toxicology, like if you've been poisoned with certain drugs, but there's not environmental toxicology. Why is that not a field? It blows my mind. And so functional medicine is trying to bring this out. So functional medicine goes, well, what if we use CLIA certified labs, FDA cleared for accuracy, and they do, and we start measuring people. So this is most of my patients, guys. 70% of my patients have undetectable glyphosate or such a low level of glyphosate that it doesn't matter. It's less than the 75th percentile. I don't care. It's not going to bother them. But then every so often, I decide to run genomics on people, and I consider this the matrix because I feel like I'm cheating. I'm like, well, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm about to tell you what's wrong with you. And I take the red pill, I, I dive down the rabbit hole, and I go, okay, look at this. Most of my patients are okay. These are the genes that produce something called glutathione. Most people don't know what that is. Glutathione is the master scavenger of toxins. So, genetically, 70% of you in this room make plenty of glutathione. And as you can see, that means that 70% of you are going to have normal glyphosate levels. But what happens to the other 30%? Now, this is a study showing you that this is proven in toxicology. Glutathione is required for pesticide removal. I'm not making this up. Here is a 30%. Now, this specific one is a one in five gene, so this is actually 20%. 20% of Caucasians, and this is just different, it's different for different races, have a deficiency in glutathione production, okay? So if you're only making 50% of the glutathione you should be making, it reasons to stand that when I check your glyphosate level, it's going to be off the charts. Because we all have glyphosate exposure, all of us. It's in all the agriculture products. It's in wheat. Unless you eat fully organic, you're going to get glyphosate. So when someone comes to me like this, you know, and this is one of the wealthiest patients I've ever seen in my practice. And I have some pretty wealthy patients. I said, wow, you're taking time bomb from lymphoma. And this is why you're overweight, and this is why you're tired, and this is why you have no energy, and this is why you have brain fog. And we cleared it. 
And you can see over time how we cleared that glyphosate level. So we have measurable, accurate labs. We know how to check it, but it's not standard of care yet, which I think it should be one day. Um, and you know what happened to this gentleman when we cleared his toxins? I'm not as achy anymore. I wake up, I'm bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I don't have brain fog. I don't have joint pain. I feel better. Shocking, because you were being poisoned, you know?